Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are still on site in San Jose at AAA, the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. We are now so grateful to be able to sit down with Dr. Augustine Fuentes. Hello. Hi. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for, for having me. Show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really excited. The, the hair is looking so good right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't grow hair like that. Look at this. This is us getting bald up there. I'm, I'm super pumped. Let me give a background on Augustine. So we have the program chair for 2017's AAA annual meeting, professor of anthropology at University of Notre Dame in Indiana since about 2002-ish. Um, by, so he did a PhD at Berkeley in anthropology, and he's done things, everything from chasing monkeys in jungles and cities, to exploring the lives of evolutionary ancestors, to examining what people actually do across the globe. And he's authored six, six books, 14 edited volumes, 150 papers, there's and chapters, something chapter, like that. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot, of, a lot work. of stuff. It's a lot of work, and everything from misconceptions about human nature, specifically in the areas of race, sex, and aggression, um, to creative spark, how imagination made humans exceptional. We'll be talking about um, a, a bunch of these different things now. But before we, you know, go into all the current stuff. You know, who were you as a kid and how did you pick up anthropology? So when I was a kid, I didn't know anthropology existed, right? <laughs> I like stuff, right? I like, I like the past, I like the present. I love trying to figure out what makes us tick, what makes us, what yeah. makes other animals. I've always really been excited about that. Uh, and I remember getting to college, sitting in a uh, class, a college classroom, which it turned out was an anthro class and they were sort of generally going over what we're gonna do. And I thought, wait, this is a thing? Th yeah. There's actually something that touches on sort of humans, the past, the future, the present, other animals, all connecting it's like okay yeah I, I think I can do this and wh wh what was the I guess you know wh where did they get where where did that happen where was the well, I mean, so there's a lot of different things that have happened. Over the course of my life, I've always been interested in asking questions. I'm really to the point of being really annoying. I'm interested in how stuff works. Um, and I'm particularly interested in how humans work uh, and why humans work and, and how we can talk about that and what does that mean for us, right? So yeah. by the time I got to college, I was really excited. I was going to double major in theater and biology. And it turns out they don't like it when you mix science and humanities. So they're like, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and then I had heard about, you know, some anthro classes, and I remember sitting in an anthro class from the uh, professor, Phyllis Dolina, who would eventually be my graduate advisor. And I'm sitting there, and there's a class on primate behavior. And she starts lecturing and talking about this chimpanzee or this langur, and she's using the pronoun she again and again, referring to these monkeys and apes. And it, it dawned on me, I'd never heard a professor use the pronoun she in general sense when talking. I'm like, what's going on here? This is pushing against what I, you know, uh, usually hear. And the more I got into anthropology, the more I understood that asking questions about who we are in a deep sense and what we do in a deep sense uh, really is exciting. I would love to uh, help get that those these questions and the whys of the deep right. sense to the roots of, of children being born around the world. Yeah, I think that's going to get us to some good question asking and some good um, kind of inquisitive spirit about how to best build and engineer the world moving forward. Okay, so I can totally see with your energy just like wanting to like ask questions, and I can see how you also got really excited about about anthropology. So now, okay, so now as you know what was what was 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 there a link between um, between that moment and about primates especially and then your interest in that and yeah. your PhD and whatnot? I mean, I think if you if you ask this sort of big picture, what 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 clicked, right? What clicked for me was because I've always been interested in biology, the body, right? And I've also been really interested in behavior and culture and literature and history. And to see that there was a space here where you could link the biology, the bones, the, the, the muscles, the guts, the DNA, mm -hmm. to our behavior, to the way we are in the world, to our closest relatives, the primates, but yet not detach that from history and institutions and politics and power to actually try to mix all those things together. I was like, oh yeah, this is what I want to do. I started by being really interested in the other primates. Because to understand what humans are, we have to understand where we sit in the sort of broader world, right? We are primates. Mm -hmm. So understanding what other monkeys and apes do and what we share with them and what we don't share with them really sets this baseline. So I became very interested not only in studying the human, but studying the human as part of the primate landscape yes. to start with. 
And then yes. I moved forward to focus more on the human. But to start with, you got to know what you're comparing. Let's, um, let's talk about that. What did you learn as you were figuring out the comparison? So what I learned really quickly, and this is from, I've spent now decades studying uh, other primates, monkeys and apes. In uh, the field. In the field and in captivity. And in captivity. So what did I really learn? Well, that humans think a lot of themselves. Um, a lot of the stuff that we think is totally human, it's actually primate. The strong social connections, the role of social networks and connectivity, yeah. the whole reality that our lives are just multi-layered, complex social day-to-day -day interfaces with all of these different individuals that have different personalities and different ways of being, that's primate. Yeah. Right? Now, humans put a special twist on it. But to understand that was actually liberating and challenging at the same time. Liberating because it's like, okay, we can actually understand a lot about the human experience by studying broadly. But then we have to focus down because evolution is about continuities and discontinuities. And so the continuities between us and the other primates are critical in understanding the core, the base of what humans are or can be. But the discontinuities, the last bit of our evolution, that trajectory in humans is what's most exciting because that shows us what the capacity of mm -hmm. the human is. Yeah, because it's just, uh, uh, what is it, less than 1% genetically different. Yeah, I mean, that we have to be careful though. So like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we share, you know, 98.6 or whatever, 98% of our DNA with a chimpanzee. We also share 37% with a daffodil, right? What does that mean? What's really important yeah. is the sort of evolutionary commonalities. So, you know, about 8 to 10 million years ago, the human lineage and the chimp and other ape lineages sort of split out and sort of went their ways. Now doesn't mean we stop influencing mm -hmm. one another and we're messing with chimps horribly right now. But what it means is that for the last six, seven, eight, nine million years, our evolutionary trajectories have been particular relative to everything else. And it's that particular yeah, history particular. that's really interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah, the particularity rather than the necessi necessity to talk about the specific genetic Right, right, right. right. So, I mean, because yeah. there are genetic differences, but people overplay what that means or doesn't mean, yeah. right? So all humans are 99.9% .9 identical Similar. genetically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's cool, but... But what's your particular trajectory right, versus right. mine? And it's not... It could be completely different lives. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's not just about our DNA, right? It, it's yes. never just about our DNA. Yes, DNA yes. does nothing by itself. And we spend way too behave, much time talking about DNA How today. you behave in the environment. Yeah. And what, yeah. yeah. So because I specifically referenced that point about the DNA difference just because it's, it's interesting because of the, what would it look like for one more right. Uh, right. augmentation, right. evolution, because right. we got to... The celestial bodies, it's like, where do we go after right, the next right. one? Well, so, I, I think there's something interesting in this whole giant panoply of life, right? Like, if we would just take that, let's just take the, the sort of genetic diversity of the planet or whatever. Humans are this little teeny, teeny, tiny, sort of insignificant, yeah. like, in, in the sense of what genomic diversity looks like uh, across all mm -hmm. living things. Yeah. However, when you talk about what humans are doing, doing to the planet the and biggest. doing to each other and doing to everything else, we're huge. Yeah. That's the question. Right? So the real exciting thing about understanding the human and human evolution is how? How did that happen? What's going on? Why are humans so important, so amazing, and so horrible all at the same time? So we're, we're one of, I think, 10 million species yeah, on the something planet. Like that. And yeah. then we're, but we're by far at the top of the well, food chain. I, I don't know if we're at the top, we're definitely messing with the whole system. We are, yeah. We're now, we figured out we are stewards of Earth and oh, we have to absolutely. figure out how to do that properly, birth out of this womb and go out into the space. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, want, I want to ask you about the, the I want to get a little bit new into the nuance of the primate, primate studies. Right. Um, <clears throat> the way you explain um, social networks, there's been a lot of... Uh, of, of, of videos that are now being released about how kind of like in many ways there's like alpha chimps right, and, and right, yeah right. and so there's like you know there's people here that have succeeded in many ways how did they succeed right, or people right. out uh, in the business world whatever so yeah what is your so, sort of view about all this so yeah this is a great topic because I think this is misrepresented all the time we have always this notion about high dominance hierarchies yes. right there's an alpha and then you know on top and it's almost an alpha always a male right alpha male the male wolf even though frequently the alpha is female, but mm -hmm. let's break that down for a moment. What does that really mean? Well, this actually whole idea of these dominance hierarchies comes from this idea of priority of access to resources. So, mm -hmm. you know, you put a peanut in the middle of four monkeys, three are going to be like, I'm not touching it, that guy is going to get it, and that guy will come and take it, right? We're like, oh, that's the alpha. What we're really seeing is this complex set of relationships, of histories, of personal dynamics. We're not seeing some endemic genetic component that makes one alpha and another not. So what we're really seeing when we talk about dom dominance hierarchies, we're seeing really complicated social realities that change over time. 
We don't talk about it that way. We, we tend to think about, well, yeah. there's the high ranking, there's the low ranking. It's like that stuff switches, that stuff moves around, and it's all contingent. It's all dependent upon their, their growing up and who they hung out with and who their friends were and what yeah. opportunities they had or didn't have. That's true for humans, it's true for chimpanzees. And then what was the word you used? You said an, it was like access to resources? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Priority of access to resources. Priority of access to resources is dependent on your uh, hierarchical position. Or your relationships, or your history. So for example, in macaque monkeys, they have pretty clear dominance hierarchies for many of the different species. Um, and so like a high-ranking male will come by and get access to the food, right? Others won't even bother. But in some cases, that high-ranking male will be around and then this one female who has three offspring, that male will come up and that male won't do anything as long as that female is around and those offspring outrank the adult male. Hmm. Social dependence, context, mm -hmm. it's all about social relationships and histories and experience. Um, so dominance is not something inherent of an individual, right? It's a process, it's a pattern. And we have to remember that because yeah. we think, we tend to think, well, this is a type A personality or this is a dominant male. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why, how, where, when? It's not mm -hmm. in his genes. Mm -hmm. the, the, the <clears throat> it's so cool when you talk about going out into the field and seeing the behaviors first mm -hmm. and then being able to see how we, um, the, it, we're very hubristic in many right. ways. Right. And so when you look at chimps, you kind of get that, oh, like right. I, get, right. I get where we evolved from. Right. Now, <clears throat> when did, how does this relate with your current professing? Because yeah. do you are you are you teaching these types of, um, of of teachings to students? Are they coming out sometimes with you to the field? Do you still go out to the field? Yeah. What are you teaching yeah. students? What have been some cool realizations of teaching for you? So I mean, I think there's a lot of things. So you know, a lot of my work is looking at the other primates. It's also looking at human biology. It's also looking at the way in which we conceive of and think about human nature. What does it mean to be human? Right? Whether it comes sex, aggression, gender, racism, all that kind of stuff. It's funny though, because going into the field to watch non-human primates, watch macaque monkeys, for example, in the field, gives humans, the students in this case, you an opportunity- You said primates. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah, so yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, I mean, I, I like to use other primates, but most people say yeah. non-human okay. primates, okay. just because to remind it, that's the monkeys, these are the humans, we're both primates. Yeah, yeah, that's good, so, okay, continue. So you've got humans, you've got, primate, you got monkeys, both being primates. <laughs> What's amazing about taking students into the field, right, uh, in this context, is that they're forced to sit and watch other complex social mammals hang out, be with each other, sort of live their lives. And, and they can reflect, even if subconsciously, on our own experience and the way in which we are even more complex than that. But watching monkeys is humbling because all, a lot of the stuff that we think we're all, oh, we're so smart, we're so socially dense, you know, humans do all this stuff. So do a lot of other organisms, right? And so we gotta step back a little bit. Just because we can destroy a rainforest doesn't mean we know how to get along better than all of those things living in the rainforest. And so taking students into the field is a great way to sort of show them what does the world look like? How does the world behave? Mm -hmm. uh, and then they can bring that back into the classroom. In the classroom, I try to do that with information about human biology, about human history, and about human society, right? So mixing together all of these different data from ranges of anthropological, biological, sociological, and historical sources to sort of bring them together and offer a little bit of a glimpse of what does reality look like. It's always messy, it's always entangled, mm -hmm. it's always you know, complicated, but oh, it's awesome. And, and if we can convey that in anthropology in the classroom, and we have the opportunity more than anyone else, if we can convey that, we're gonna prepare those students no matter what they go on to do with this skill set, right? They'll know it's complicated, but they'll be able to say something about that complexity. Yes. And there's this process of just being mindful when you are in the field, and I, I, I really, I'm just so fascinated by field work. Yeah. Now, okay, now, now what, what is, give us an example of when you connect in the biological and the cultural um, ties into field work when they come back, how, right. yeah, what does that look like? Well, so let's think, some of the work I've been doing uh, for the last couple decades is uh, um, uh, particularly in this area called ethnoprimatology, right? Mm -hmm. So it's thinking about humans and other primates entangled in ecologies, co-constructing their relationships in different places of the planet. I've done a lot of work in Bali, 
uh, many years ago, looking at macaque monkeys, humans, Balinese Hinduism, temples, mm. forests, rivers, tourism, all of these things connected together. And they kind of cohabitate yeah, together. Yeah, they co-create each other. Co they co they yeah. shape those interfaces. Yeah. Whether we're talking about you know, uh, sharing the same space, whether we're talking about the economic input from tourists who come to see monkeys for the local villages, or whether we're talking about the potential exchange of, of bacteria and viruses, yeah. all of those levels. And so when you, when you think about this from an in an anthropological context, when you ask students to sort of reflect on this, it's that crazy mesh of reality that acts to inspire the students to think that they can take this information and go somewhere else. Maybe some of the students who work with me, well, I know, some of the students who work with me on monkeys and humans and interfaces have gone on to do all sorts of different things. But in their new lives, in their new worlds, they're like, well, I understand these things are all related. They're entangled. They're yeah. pushing and pulling on each other. And yeah. in anthropology, one of our underlying goals or what we say is we want to make the uh, familiar strange and the strange familiar. Mm. And once you break this bubble of, well, everything is the way I just lived, and realize there are many, many successful ways to be human or to be primate, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the world opens up a little bit to more possibility and more hope, even in times of great tragedy. Yeah, I love how, uh, how you said that, uh, make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. That's really important. And just this is inherently a very multidisciplinary field. So mm -hmm. that, that, and our show is as well. So when I, when I hear you talk about augmenting the perception of students to see things as multidisciplinary, that's fascinating. Um, Augustine, give us your kind of like your some of your most profound realizations of dealing with students or with teaching right. students. What have been some of your favorites? Well, I think I think I mean there's a couple things that just jump out. I, I think one of the most important things is is teaching students um, is a great humbling experience, right? Because even in, in in the classes that haven't been great, you can see those sparks, right? That 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 potential of those aha moments, yeah. that this desire to know what's going on, how does stuff work? Even in the most blasé students, every now and then you hook them with something interesting and, and all of a sudden it's there. And, and that, that always gives me great confidence that, that as messed up as the world is uh, and is getting, um, there are so many people, a majority of people, want to do something good in the world. They want to figure it out. And teaching actually constantly reinforces that. Because if you do a decent job, if you open the space for the students to be the co-producers of knowledge, stuff happens. Stuff gets done. Yeah. And that's exciting. So that, that. That's, that's one. I, I think like another thing. a spark thing, in the yeah, eyes yeah, of the students yeah. to, to learn and to build value into the world. That's exactly. Really, yeah. and, and another thing is that by teaching, I learn. And I know that's a trite mm -hmm. phrase. People say this all the time. But I can't tell you, every time I step into the classroom, every time I start a lecture or a workshop or some sort of engagement, it's material I know. I wrote the stuff. Maybe I even wrote the book we're using. And here I'm going along and someone says something or someone introduces a perspective or someone just raises their hand and asks me to slow down and sort of re-explain this. And in those cases, all of a sudden, you know, my, my mind is blown. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I did not even recognize this or I didn't understand these two things or I didn't see how this relates. And so constantly being pushed by students and, and graduate students in particular are great yeah. because they're like, you know, yeah. junior colleagues in the sense that they have so much knowledge and so much excitement. They don't have the experience that you do, but they push in really amazing ways. Yeah. And so it's those mind blowing <laughs> events, right? And that's like hanging out with friends, right? Or family or sometimes yeah. you sit there. It's, it's when someone is just like, well, what, why is that? And pushes you a little bit. That's when you yeah. get really, that's when you learn, right? Yeah. Complacency is the worst thing that can happen, right? And, and in a good classroom, there's no complacency because you're constantly getting pushed. I love that. It's, it's so true when you're asked a question by like a junior colleague and then you gain a new sense of seeing things because they're teaching you. Right, um, right. That's, that's really, that's really even fun. Even teaching you what's important now, right? Yeah. I mean, it would be horrible if we were all in these like age cohorts never being able to talk across ages, totally. right? We wouldn't know what was going on. Because they, they grew up with the computers and the, yeah. so they've had a different access to right. the abundance of information. That right, infinite, right. Yeah. the whole way and just and all, every sort of generation has their different experiences, their different lives and by listening to them, you know, we get enriched and they, by listening to us, us get also enriched. get enriched. Totally, yeah. yeah. Totally. It's that, um, 
the intergenerational wisdom dissemination yeah. yep. And, yep. and integration. Wisdom, yeah. man. I'm part of this big project called the Evolution of Wisdom, working oh, with philosophers, cool. theologians, humanists, anthropologists, biologists. It's a, this whole notion that there is something out there that we can think of as wisdom, the yes. capacity yes. to as discern and do, do right in the world as best you can. Yes. It's a really cool concept, and I wouldn't even have thought about it given my training until I was interacting with philosophers and theologians and literary folk. They push yeah. me to think, yeah. well, you know, can we think about this in a way that makes sense outside of just biology or outside of just an ethnographic context? Yeah, um, so. and, and the 100 billion people that built civilization, they would want us to retain some sort of an right. essence, the essentials of wisdom that, that can be I, passed on. I, I can't, I mean, I could be totally wrong, but this is what I believe. That you know, a couple million years ago, our deep ancestors, right, in in, in Eastern Africa or maybe even Southern Africa, um, were were developing this incredible capacity to see a stone, and in that stone to see something else, to see a tool, to see a change, and reshaping that, and recreating that, yeah. and sharing that, not just individually, right, but sharing that with the young and the old, and working together to sort of craft something, this kind of creativity and collaboration. And I would like to think that we have inherited it down all that time, and we are constantly doing it. We're working with iPhones now instead of stone tools, but it's the same capacity, this, 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 I, this capacity to imagine to create, to collaborate. What I think yeah. being human is, is to look at the world, see what's around us, see what is, imagine alternative possibilities, and to get together as a group and try to make those things reality. Yeah, that's so well said, man. That's so well said, yeah. But this is anthropology, that's so right? Well said, anthropology yeah. offers this insight because it forces you not to just say, well, it's this reason or it's that reason or single cause. It's all about this complex mass. And that's what turns out the public off to anthropology because you know anthropologists are famous for saying oh it's complicated but it's complicated doesn't mean we can't talk about it we can't know about it we can't learn it we just have to figure out how to best convey that complexity in its wondrous you know reality and I think you just did the did it right there with the contrast you gave a contrast something that's super relatable today of using an iPhone and building apps and collaborating on that and then using a stone tool seeing a rock and making it into a stone tool that can be used for that 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 is so I, I I've they're written, connected man <laughs> and I and I kind of and I kind of did a similar thing where I uh, was very recently writing about just what it would have been like to you know look at the moon and worship yeah. the moon and whatnot right. and then now we have rockets that go to right. the moon right. so right. this just this yeah but we haven't lost that awe and wonder. Right, so I was flying in last night from Boston, late night. Right, yeah, you like um, went and presented I, yeah, no, one crazy. day. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, I came back. So I'm flying in, doing horrible things for the planet by flying too much, but that's a whole other thing. So I'm flying in, and I'm sitting on the aisle seat, but the window's open, and, and the airplane is about to land here in San Francisco, and it banks, and and I see this slip like a half moon, mm. shining, brilliant, but a little bit. The smoke is making it a little bit red, mm -hmm. so not quite a blood moon, but you know, just sort of that look. And I look at that, and in that moment. I shared everything across millennia mm. of that wonder for the moon. Even though we've sent yeah, people yeah, there yeah. and landed there, yeah. it doesn't in any way, shape, or form change that awe and wonder. And it, I think that's, that's the ticket. And how do we get, is it important to get seven and a half billion people to, when they look at the moon, to get them to be more awe and have more wonder? Is to yeah. have that sense of, they all have that capacity. They have the capacity. We totally. beat it out of them as they grow up. <laughs> you know, we, we've, we've taken this incredible, what I call the creative spark, this incredible capacity for creativity and imagination and humanity. And many societies, ours in particular, tries to grind that out of people to become functional, become practical, right? We can do great things and still have on wonder. We can be playful and imaginary and creative and still produce on a regular basis. I think we have to be very careful. Every human alive has the capacity for awe and wonder. And yet, most humans, because of inequality, because of political oppression, because of other contexts, aren't able to even find the time to do it, whereas others have been, had it trained out of themselves. And that's, that's what scares me. Well, let's, this is the newest book. This is yeah. your the, my last book. I have a new book coming out next year, but the last book, book was coming. The Creative okay. Spark: How Imagination yes. Made Humans Exceptional. And and this is kind of what we're what we're talking about right now is that the imagination of the rock, the imagination of the right. phone, that the imagination to get to that place has 
in that collaborative spirit to get there. So, um, so tell us, I mean, tell us a bit about that, but also some of these other, you know, I really also want to talk about the misconceptions, human nature, race, sex, and aggression. So let's just bust this down clearly, right? So this concept of human nature is wrong. Let us say human natures. If you're really interested mm. in that, there are many successful ways to be human, period. We know that, the data are in. There's just a huge diversity of ways to do the human thing well. So let's, let's put that aside, right? Natures, that, human natures. Human natures, I think that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is many people think that there's some core, usually some sort of genetic or biological core for the complexity of those natures, right? And, and, and obviously everything has a biological facet. We're organisms, we're organic creatures, right? But we're never disentangled. Let me give those three examples, right? Race, sex, and aggression, right? So many people, despite what they might say, believe that black, white, Asian, Latino, Native American, what have you, are biologically identifiable clusters. They are not. Yeah, right? this is very Ra important. Race as we use it is not reflective of a biological unit. However, yeah. it is a very li real lived experience. When we say race is a social construct, we don't mean it's fake. We mean it's totally real. Yeah. It's just we made it up and, and imposed it on the world. And because yeah. of racism, right, what race you happen to embody or be classified in can have deleterious biological, social, political, historical, experiential outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's what's really right. important. None of this is in our nature, mm -hmm. right? It is in our histories, our institutions, our cultures. Human biological diversity is, is, is incredible. Humans vary in skin color and height and shape and by multiple, multiple populations around the planet. Mm -hmm. None of that fits into African, European, Asian. Mm -hmm. Those races mm -hmm. are not biological units, but there sure are real things in people's minds. And so I think one of the things to push against is to say, well, what do we know about race and racism? And those two always have to be together, right? Because race is prominent because of racism. Mm -hmm. So that's one example, mm -hmm. right? It's, there's no gene for black, white, or Asian, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of institutional, political, and economic infrastructures <laughs> for black, white, and Asian. Very that's one example. Very important way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. So the sex thing, the sex thing, you know, let's take sex and gender, right? Um, you know, gender is the, the lived experience dynamic embodiment in a cultural context of sex and sexuality. Sex in the most specific context is about biology. So we tend to identify male and female, that is uh, in mammals, right? Females, right, uh, tend to give birth and lactate, males don't. But if we actually break down the biology, we find that it's pretty complicated. There's a whole range of things that we associate as male or female. They're not two separate things, it's the same species. It's a biological continuum and humans fall along that continuum. Again, there are many successful ways to be human. So when we talk about human natures, mm -hmm. right? We can't say there's a male nature and a female nature. Those are nonsensical statements. What we can say is different cultures, institutions, histories, and bodies map to this diversity of a way of being gendered and sexed in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's really important because yeah. if if we just use that as our starting point, not that male men are from Mars and women from Venus, if we use this sort of diversity of successful ways to be sex and gendered, mm -hmm. then people have a lot less problem fitting in in a society. Because yeah. right now, we're trying to cram everyone into two little cubby holes, yeah. and you know what? The vast majority of us cannot fit in either of those spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Not perfectly. Yeah. So that's, that's really good. And then, aggression. you know, the thing on aggression, I think that's really important in this day and age because we have this whole notion deep from our sort of Western political uh, philosophical histories of this, this demon inside us, this horribleness, particularly in men, right? This sort of original sin, if you will, of violence and aggression, that humans are demonic males. Um, and we tend to think that warfare, aggression, violence, cruelty seem to be at the heart of what it means to be human. If you look at the fossil and archaeological record, if you look at the other primates, we find that, no, what is characteristic of primates? What's characteristic of humans? Strong social bonding, social complexity, the potential for great violence and aggression, but the reality that compassion and working together, collaborating, is probably at least as, if not more common than aggression. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. peace and war are not opposites. They're all part of the same capacity we have for getting together, for bonding, for making stuff happen. Sometimes it has horrible outcomes, yeah. other times it doesn't. Yeah. But there's no naturalness to a super aggressor. If that was the case, we wouldn't be here, you know? Yeah. 
Two million years ago, we were small, naked, fangless, hornless, clawless critters, right? With some rocks and some sticks and all of these giant predators out there and all these challenges. Yeah. What did we have? We had each other. That's actually really each well, yeah. I think that's really evident in human bodies and in human biologies and, and the human uh, paleoanthropological and archeological record. That doesn't mean that we didn't run around hitting each other in the head too. Yeah. But that's just not our go-to, right? Yeah. Aggression is not the yeah, human yeah, nature. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, the, the, that, was, that was really profound at the end when you said that, when we were just so n naked and raw in our, in our, in our nascent stages of, yeah. of being human that we, were, that we had each other. That that was re that was really profound. I, I want to see if I can if I can give a, a so let's see if I if I got this right. So with so with race, there is a we're we're all human. We're all one human, race. Human race. Right. Human race. Looking from the moon, we're all human race. And then biologically. What, biologically. Right. And then the um, and then the the, the so it's, it's become a. We, we made the societal, we said societal differences. Historical, political, social structures, right? We're going to divide this cluster here, this cluster here, this cluster here, and we're going to call them things. We're going to call that, them things. They're real things, right? Yeah. Those divisions are real in the sense that they're created, they have history, they have institutions, they yes. have impacts. Yes. But they're yes. not biology. Yes, right? yes. They're not some evolutionary trajectory. We didn't have three groups of humans, humans branching exactly, off. Exactly, yeah. with different colors right. or, or right. bodies right. or whatever. Right. So um, race is real, but it's not biology. And then there is now to move on to to um, to gender sort of sex sex to move on to sex. Then there is a, a a kind of it's not a it's not a species split, but then there's a male and a female that make it so that you can have a procreation and a child. Yeah, I mean there's there's biology of reproduction. Biology right? of reproduction, but then right. there's a continuum of ways to express being human. These human right. natures. Right. Right. And so right. yeah, okay. And and so the, what what we would call like where do you draw the line between male and female? Right, biologically yeah. speaking, yeah. it's arbitrary. Right, yeah. it's like drawing a line between Europe and Asia. We're, we're, you know, yeah. we we don't have a line. We just say, well, it's these mountains, right? These are Europeans. These are Asians. That doesn't. And then we say, well, this is masculine or this is feminine. We make up those decisions. Yeah, yeah. The human spreads across the whole place. And then there are certain things like ocean, the big five yeah. personality, yeah. and so you can make approximate um, assessments of, yeah. of psychometrics and whatnot. Totally, yeah. and so, and then and there, you know, like what's classified as feminine in one society might not be classified wholly as feminine That's in right. another. And yeah. what's interesting, what's classified feminine as masculine may not map to the sex body. That's right. Right, they may be, you know, you, the sex body might move around between all of those gendered concepts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because now you see a whole movement for males to be more vulnerable. Yeah. Um, women want to take on more uh, work or career roles in that and, sense. And, and they always great. did, right? I mean, the, the thing is, yeah. is that gender roles are fluid and they're historically variable, yes. right? So yes. the way we are right now, it's not necessarily the way the were, we were in the past, nor will it be in the future, but it is the way we are right now. And yes. so we got to deal with that and sort of think about what does that mean? What it does mean is that we're malleable. We're open to change, and and I and I am always very interested in what the next evolutions of yeah. civilization are, and if humans, because I do think there is something to do with this, um, the way that we use technology and how that's affecting our brains and where yeah. that's taking us, and then also yeah, the singularity, the transhumanism, right, merging right, with right, AI, right, all right, that kind of yeah. stuff. So there is going to be this next evolution, and then just the way that you know, even with neural diversity, the way that some children are being born into not wanting to have social engagement. <laughs> Right. but wanting to just go really right. deep into learning about right. something. And so if that's the case, who are we to pull people away from that thing and right. push them towards other things? Yeah. And Neurodiversity is actually, that's one of the new frontiers, right? Yeah. When we get, uh, now that we're realizing, oops, wait, there is no normal. Yeah. There's just a whole range <laughs> of being human. Um, <clears throat> and understanding that is actually gonna be critical for educational policy, yeah. Yeah. right? For, yeah. for what our, our future societies look like. Um, yeah. There's a whole bunch of other diversity that, that, that we already know about that we still have trouble dealing with. Yeah. Man, neurodiversity is going to be the hard. It's going to be really hard for people to deal with. Yeah, and then that then the then the last point that you made about aggression was was quite interesting. That that I, I really enjoyed thinking about just the cooperation um, yeah. that we've had over time to, to build and, what we have. And cooperation doesn't mean lack of aggression, right? Like who 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 wins the battle, right? The army that's most aggressive or the army that cooperates best. The army that cooperates best, the army that is strongly bonded, yeah. right? And so, like the Sparta. Um, they, yeah, 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 yeah. So, the, the, I mean, that's what's actually really important. People try to do.
peace and uh, violence as opposites. They're not. They're just humans do cooperation really, really well. So when we do it for really violent, cruel things, we do it better than anything else. But yeah. we have the capacity to do that. At the same time, we have the capacity for incredible peace, for incredible compassion. And that is just as if not more common in our histories than the violence. So, so both of them are part of our said. capacity, you know? So stop saying that they're opposites and talk about them as capacities. And what do we do with capacities? We modify them, we exploit them, we engage with them. Let's think seriously about this stuff. What's the lie about monogamy? So, I mean, here, here's the big problem. Uh, monogamy is a particular uh, historical concept about marriage practice, right? So monogamy in the, in the uh, reproductive biology is that t one part, two partners stay together for one mating season or longer exclusively. It's actually very rare. In, in, a in, mating season. Yeah, well, <laughs> even a mating season, right? So many, many organisms don't do that, right? Uh, most organisms are, are uh, polygamous in the sense they move around and have multiple mating partners, right? So do humans. Mm -hmm. We have social, structural, cultural, historical norms and expectations about reproductive relationships, and we've codified those in marriage contracts yeah, yeah, or different yeah. kinds of things. And so monogamy as a political philosophical orientation has got all mixed up with the biology yeah. that separate those two. There's no um, putting, there's no rings on, on chimps. There's no, no like. No, but there's these incredible relationships between individuals. Yeah. Sometimes they're Are called they social lifelong? bonds. Do they have a lifelong? Um, well, many do. Like, sometimes they have sex, sometimes they don't. So that's the thing oh, is, when we think about pair bonds, bonds between two individuals that are very, very strong, those can go for a lifetime, but they might have nothing to do with reproduction. Yeah, They might right. be about all sorts of other that's stuff. That's right. And it's the same for humans. And we could have, you know, two humans could be very, very tightly uh, bonded in a reproductive context, but it doesn't mean they don't find interest in having sex with other so that yeah. that conflation with sex reproduction social bonding you know those are actually all different things they all come together in certain contexts yeah. but if, if we try to pretend that they're all the same yeah, and like yeah, if everyone really is spending their whole point. life trying to find their you know uh, soulmate you know that's a problem find soul partners find soul social partners, partners social find partners, bonds, yeah. bonds hang out and yes. make connections and not and not always will those bonds be sexual yeah. and, and uh, who knows um, yeah exactly sometimes they'll be for a year sometimes they'll be for seven years right. or whatever right, right. um but th that that weird expectation that like oh boom you know find one and done one. that's a weird concept yeah. not that it doesn't happen a yes. lot yes yes but and it, it is, works for certain people. Yeah. But it is not, we can't think again, back to this human nature, right? What human do humans natures. do? We're messy, yeah. we're complicated, and we're social. Get over it. Yeah. Wow, this has been so enlightening. Um, awesome. And I guess just to, to wrap it up, I'd love to um, hear some of your, um, your synthesis about like, what you see as the current state of humanity and where we're going. Oi. <laughs> I mean, so my, my, the two things. One is general humanity, right? Our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, right? Um, I, I love humans. I, I'm incredibly optimistic about human potential and human capacity. Everything I know about human biology, about our deep history, about our recent history, and about our present inspires me to see what humans can do, right? Yeah. For good and for worse. So I'm optimistic about humanity. What I'm not optimistic about is our contemporary political, economic, and social landscapes. Mm -hmm. I think there's a degree of cruelty and a degree of inequality that is just unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really worried about the immediate future because of inequality, because of racism, because of sexism, and because of a kind of institutional bias that rips people apart. And, and while humans have great potential, fighting against these inequalities and injustices is pushing us to our limit. So I, I'm worried about that. And what would be a solution that you enjoy Well, we, we've got to ramp down. In, if we're never going to get rid of in, inequality, that's always here to stay now, given our systems and our histories. But we can ramp it down a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, education. Oh, and I, and I, and I thought I, I've, I've, I've started proposing this on the show now that the, here's the top SES in the world, right. there's the lowest SES in the world. It's just that um, if everybody can move up at the same time and then right. you just bring the lowest yeah. SES yeah. up closer. Yeah. Yeah, something yeah. like, yeah. Well, I mean, what you do is shave a little bit off, like, you know, you could, anyways, th that's a whole economic yeah. argument. Yeah. But yes, reducing inequality. I think that's critical. But also education is a, is a great way to do that. So let's reinvest in our schools. Let's make teaching matter. Let's make learning matter. Let's really, really care about kids. I think that's, uh, right now I get the yeah, impression yeah. that most people don't. 
They don't care about kids in the, in the environment. They don't care about kids in school. They don't care about kids in health. Not really. Um, if we cared more about kids, kids we'd probably yeah. get a little bit yeah. further along the road, road to making the world better and reducing inequality. Yeah, and we were mentioning that earlier in the conversation as well, just this deep care for yeah. augmenting the perception of children to understand like the contrast that you were making um, before about where society was and where we are now, that we had the stone and we made it into tools and now we have a f technology like computers and right. we make that into tools with exactly. the apps and the things that we use them for. But it's all social, it's all creative and it's how we use it, right? I mean, we could use that stone tool to cr knock someone over the head yeah. Yeah. or we could use it to work together to build more stone tools to teach others and to go skin a critter or dig up a root or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. We have that choice. Yes, yes. This has been so fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm deeply grateful that you joined us. Uh, I, Thanks, I always love having this opportunity to chat. Thanks so Thank much. you. Thanks for coming on to the show. Hugely appreciated. My pleasure. Hugely appreciated. Awesome. Um, please check out the links in the bio for AAA and for Augustine's work. Um, also, do give us your comments. We'd love to hear from you about the episode, what you all thought. Uh, go and manifest your dreams in the world. Go and build the future, everyone. Thanks. Much love, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Awesome. Wow. That was so fun. This is a great concept. We're a fun interview, man. That I'm glad just... you had a good time.